Ohio gazimus. That's us starting with the O for Shakespeare and the O of it's all one and happy Valentine's Day. First we breathe and since we're going to breathe anyway, we can crush and sniff. We've got the mint today, some beautiful fresh mint to crush and sniff and breathe and anchor in wisdom and anchor in healing. We've also got rosemary, which I, I have said, you know, pick one. Um, but the rosemary, the rosemary is pungent and not as lovely maybe for Valentine's Day, but the rosemary was used quite a bit with lovers because, first of all, people sometimes, because they couldn't bathe quite as often as we have the opportunity to, they used herbs, and this is where the boutonniere situation comes from, using uh, herbs nearby the face to counter the smells of the world, <laughs> of, of your environment. But also people used rosemary, lovers used rosemary, quarters used rosemary, because if you had a strong scent, because it is the strongest one of the five senses for memory, right? Which is why rosemary, that's for remembrance. That's what Ophelia says. And, and so if you smell rosemary again, you remember when you were with your beloved or your intended or all of that kind of stuff. So people used it to connect the memory of themselves to somebody they wanted to be remembered by or vice versa. So that's a great little herb tip for Valentine's Day. And speaking of Ophelia, she's also the one who says, she sings, tomorrow is, <laughs> I'm out of voice today, um, tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, all in the morning be times. And, um, and, and then she ends it with, to be your Valentine. So that's mention of Valentine there in Hamlet, but it's also a character in Two Gentlemen of Verona. Uh, one character is Valentine, because he's true hearted. And the other one is Proteus, who's changeable, right? Um, that's what Protean means, fickle, can be fickle of heart. So hello, hello everyone. Um, so, but there's two other plays where Valentine shows up. There's one in Midsummer Night's Dream, St. Valentine is past, so that would be for tomorrow. And, um, Romeo and Juliet, the romantic play. So I'm wearing a little, heart today. You can't see it black on black, but there's a little heart there pinned on, and I've got my rose, because I thought, oh, maybe our, maybe our line of the week is a rose by any other name, uh, which Juliet is in Juliet's beautiful speech, but uh, there's so many, there's so many options. The other one I was thinking of for from Romeo and Juliet is Mercutio's line. And he says uh, to Romeo, you are a lover, borrow Cupid's wings and soar with them beyond a common bound. So take the wings of love and fly with it beyond, you know, normal boundaries, go out of your comfort zone, right? So it's a beautiful line. Uh, Mercutio also has a brother named Valentine. He is mentioned in the play, but not, but is no lines and no specific character unless a director has a really big cast and wants to put him in there. And, you know, if, if I were doing it, I would put whoever played Valentine in Two Gentlemen of Verona just for fun as a little Easter egg kind of thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about love today. And we have Hannah Sylvester, the district herbalist, back with us to talk about aphrodisiacs. But I'm going to mention a few things, too, in Shakespeare. Um, I'm trying to think. I never sort of plan this out. I just have a general idea of what I'm going to do. So, of course, we talked about thorns last week with Deborah D'Angelo, and she was talking about that the thorn is a measure of protection. So I got these uh, roses, and these are sort of, you know, common cultivated roses. And again, the, um, the thorns are cut off because in these days, I think we're sort of infantilized. Everything is predictive text and doing everything for us and for taking stuff off. But the roses, they're protecting us from the thorns, but the thorns are for protection. And we talked in that show about how you can use the thorns for protection. And then I got one perfect red rose. Now it's an American Beauty rose. Thorns are cut off as well. 
what if I want the thorns? Um, we put in last week's show Morticia Adams because she cuts off the roses and, and leaves the thorns, which I love. Um, and I played Morticia Adams in the fourth grade play. Anyway, so uh, these these roses are not the roses they had in England. They're not the roses in the book because these are cultivated, more cultivated roses, and those were more wild roses are cultivated, not quite as cultivated as we have now. So that's the idea of the, and this red rose is sticking up because it's soaring beyond a common bound, right? So cherries I thought was another one. I don't have real cherries today, but I have these cocktail cherries. Cherries are always good for cocktails. And they, uh, because two of them grow on a double stem, a lot of times that's used for friendship in Shakespeare. But love, friendship is a form of love. There are many forms of love, but we're going to talk about, you know, what that, that anchored love is. And um, strawberries, of course, a lot of times people use, look at this thing. So, I mean, this is enormous. Here's the other bowl. Not, this is the biggest one. But um, in Shakespeare's day, they didn't come, you know, there's a line, I must borrow me gargantua's mouth. I think that's Rosalind in, in um, As You Like It. But pff, anyway, the, so the strawberries in the book are the straw wild strawberries, and they're very tiny, and they're very sweet, and they don't have you know, thick skins, and they just kind of melt in your mouth, and they're amazing and delicious. But if you're not going to put chocolate with them you, and keep it Shakespeare, you can put mint with them. So freshens the breath. It brings a little extra pop of flavor to the strawberry. Um, it's just a lovely, lovely combination, strawberries and mint instead of strawberries and chocolate. The other thing, I'll get, I'll get to the fig last. I don't know what Tan is going to tell us about. So she might bring up ginger because ginger is this warming spice and can be very sexy. And I think I mentioned I got this saffron honey. I'm sorry, it's backwards. At the farmer's market in D.C., I'm back in New York today, back home finally. And um, I don't know if you can see, but it has these little threads. And we will do a whole show on saffron because saffron is amazing. And saffron is coming up in crocuses. Here, here you can kind of... There's these little threads of saffron. Well, saffron can be an aphrodisiac as well, and also aids in weight loss. I and I, um, I don't know if this is too much information, but I ended up having too many spoonfuls of saffron honey one night last week, and I two pounds disappeared by the next morning. It was amazing. So Valentine also, it's in Shakespeare because I think uh, we had a, it's a 14th century Valentine. There are many St. Valentines actually, but there was one St. Valentine who in Rome married couples who, when it was a, the ban, they couldn't get married because of the church edict, uh, because the church liked to organize the marriages and arrange the marriages. So he married loving couples on the sly. <laughs> And that's my cat making himself known. He's been very sick, so I'm just going to give him a little camera time. Somebody asked. There he is. There he is. Oh, he's, he's loving me up there. <laughs> anyway, um, Dio. Uh, and the other, it may have been the same St. Valentine who put uh, little messages of compassion and love on parchment hearts and, and gave them out to people. So both of those things are lovely. I didn't finish about the cherries. So the cherries can be sexual for a number of reasons. Uh, Shakespeare talks about cherry lips and cherry nose and all that stuff. A lot of times as a color, people use the stems to tie little love knots with their tongue and show a particular dexterity. But then we're getting into like the Shakespeare blue show, which I keep promising, but I don't know when to do it or where. Um, we'd have to be after midnight. And then we have... This is kind of fig juice, and if you watched the show then, we made a sweet potato recipe and posted a sweet potato recipe for Thanksgiving and Christmas that doesn't use the marshmallows because we did a show on what real marsh marshmallow was and is, and uh, it was a it's a delicious sweet potato recipe. Oh, sweet potatoes are an aphrodisiac as well. Um, uh, Falstaff, when he's trying to woo Mistress Page and Mistress Ford in Merry Wives of Windsor, says, let the sky rain potatoes and snow Eringos. And Eringos is this funny little plant. Of course, we have a picture of it. So fig, oh, somebody said happy Valentine's Day, Theo. He thanks you. 
We don't have any. I have to go get treats for him later. Anyway, the I we you soak the figs in black tea, so it's still incredibly sweet. But I I tested this out for you guys last night, and I made a cocktail with this sort of fig syrup and a little vodka, which is not in Shakespeare, and a little champagne. Actually, mine was Prosecco, and it's amazing. So if you have need a short term. You can get figs usually at the grocery store. Soak them in some black tea, use the syrup, and cocktail it up. Now, so the most famous, possibly the most famous sonnet in Shakespeare is Sonnet 116. Do you want to recite it? Um, sorry. Um, which is used in a lot of weddings because it has the word marriage in it. And, and, <laughs> He's vocal today. Uh, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. So it's interesting that he it's less of the body, of the mind, a meeting of the minds. And there's a lot of research that says that couples who have who have similar goals or work on the same things or all of that kind of stuff whose minds are aligned are are the are the couples that last and thrive and do well so don't don't admit impediments to that love is not love and this is what i was really thinking should be the line of the day love is not love which alters when it alteration finds and i was trying to do that in the card reading last week and, and was stumbling over it but it's basically the marriage vows of for better or for worse Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. So if, if something changes and the love goes away, it was something else, not love. It could have been ego, could have been, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why we think that we love people. Um, or bends with the remover to remove. So I certainly, you know, I'm going to write an article about unfriending and we were talking about how you know, I still love people. We not, may not be in touch anymore, but you can still love them if they're not, even if they're not in their life and even if they're not in your life and they can still love you. My friend Lindy used to say that people were in your life for a reason or a season or a lifetime. And I always didn't, I didn't understand that for a long time, but I, I'm, yeah, I'm coming around to it now. Um, oh no is the next part. Oh no. So there's the oh, the all one. No, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. So that is again, um, the marriage vow for better or for worse. Sometimes people with Shakespeare get a little, uh, intimidated by the ED, but it's just for scansion, which is the heartbeat, the iambic which is one of the reasons Shakespeare sometimes can be easier to remember and committing a line to to your but it also it it reinforces life and it reinforces love which is one of the reasons some people believe it has lasted lo these 400 years right it is the heart beat um, it is the star. I know I'm breaking this up, but I'm just going through it. It is the star. I think he's talking about the North Star that a lot of people navigated by to, well, sailors, not, I mean, I guess walkers too, <laughs> to every wandering bark. And we talked about once a bark is a little boat sort of tossed about on the sea. And Romeo says, you know, the seasick, weary bark. He talks about that. Uh, whose worth's unknown, although, though, although his height be taken. So you don't know the worth of love. You can't really measure that, but you can measure, you can do a measure of a man, measure of a woman, but, but the love is priceless. You can't measure that worth. Love's not time's fool. The rosy lips and cheeks uh, within his bending sickle's compass come. Yeah. <laughs> So time is often represented with a sickle coming in and sort of mowing the stuff. And, and time does compass our little lives, but time is not, love is not hemmed in by time. You know, the roses in your lips and cheeks might fade, but the love, if it's a marriage of true minds, is still there and always lasts, uh, but bears it out. So he says it better than I do. Love alters not 
with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. So there you go. If this be error, if this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved or woman. Um, but anyway, he's a man. But so there you go. And that's why one of the sonnet is so famous because every single line reinforces the, the anchoring aspects of true love, not, not protean love, but Valentine love. And that's why we celebrate this day. You don't have to get all caught up in the hearts and flowers and, you know, uh, the cheesy side of it. Unless you want to, because it's fun, and we all need more reasons to celebrate love, right? And they sent me these, and these are, they are cutie pie. So now we're going to bring Hannah on to talk about some aphrodisiacs. Line of the week is, oh, we'll go through it at the end. Hannah, 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 hello. Hello. Welcome back. <laughs> uh, back. So, happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. And to Theo, of course, as well. Yes, yeah, Theo is making his presence known today. Um, <laughs> he's been he's been sick, so he needs a lot more love, and I'm fine with that. I'll give him a lot more love. Anyway, tell us what aphrodisiacs do you have planned for us today? Well, a few that might be quite obvious, um, and I wanted to kind of talk about the the less obvious side of um, of aphrodisiacs because it's one of those things that sort of a lot of people kind of still think of herbs as if I take this herb, it will have that action. So thinking of them as a very kind of symptomatic way of dealing with problems that kind of go on with the with the human body. But if you don't have the right terrain for it to happen, it's not going to happen, whatever you drink or, or eat. What do you mean um, the right terrain? What do you, uh, like, physical terrain? Mm. <laughs> So, um, so I mean, for, for once, without a phrase, um, you've got to kind of want to do it to do it. Um, okay. So, <laughs> so, if, want if to do? Not, <laughs> so if you're not feeling well enough, or if your body isn't isn't well enough or balanced yeah. enough, you're probably not going to get anywhere with any amount of aphrodisiacs that, that you eat or drink. So. Okay. I'm really pleased you mentioned ginger. So you've got to have good circulation. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you increase the circulation with ginger or with cinnamon or even with cloves, that's mm -hmm. going to help to to get you warmer and to feel a little bit more stimulated. So mm -hmm. that's going to help. So mm -hmm. if you're really if you're cold and your circulation isn't very good, you need to warm yourself up. So ginger definitely, definitely comes into play there. So if you load a bunch of ginger and clove into a tea, is that, so are you getting your blood flowing and just getting the kind of warmth and sizzle going in the body? You're getting your circulation moving. You're getting the blood flowing and that's what you need to be doing. The blood needs to be flowing well and right. ginger is definitely going to do that. Okay. So that goes for both men and women mm -hmm. or whatever gender you identify as, uh, Ginger and clove will work for you. <laughs> okay. And then, you know, if you're, if you're really stressed, you know, yeah. you're not going to really feel like doing anything then either. So if you can just kind of relax and calm, that's going to help as well. So, you know, you're nice breathing, but, you know, you can also bring in things like milky oats. Aww. Oats, really? Mm. Wow. Milky oats. So the lovely green milky oats um, before they before they've kind of over dried. So green milky oats are a fantastic tonic for the nervous system. Oh, wow. um, and really, they can they can help to reduce anxiety and they can just help you to feel more relaxed. And they're very very nourishing for the nervous system. And then there's other things you can use as well that aren't in Shakespeare, like skullcap and passion flower and things like that. Okay. Um, but uh, but milky oats are really really good. Now it's so interesting because I just bought oat milk today, and the first time I tried it was when I was in London, which is almost a year ago. This next week it was the last time I was able to get to London, and uh, oat milk is delicious. Will will that work if you take if you drink some oat milk maybe? 
a little bit. It's better than nothing. Um, but but extracted milky oats in a tea or in a tincture, lovely. But yeah, oat milk looks a good place to start. Can yeah, that could that could certainly do something. But and then kind of sort of linking in with that, um, you're going to want to kind of soothe and moisten and nourish dried tissue. So right. oats can help with that too. But so can our friend the marshmallow as well, or the common the mallow, which I mentioned earlier. I'm psychic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I remember you talking about oats mo moisturizing as well and, and, and um, taking a bath in oats. And I think a vino does a lot of oat concoctions for, for, um, for dry skin. And the interesting thing, I was thinking about oats, and also you said green oats, and green is often a color for a love as well. I think it's the color of the heart chakra. So people always think of red as love, and it's like the base chakra and, and, you know, passion and sexual love, but green is the healing love. So I love that you said green. All the time, all I'm trying to say. <laughs> So we want to moisten up the tissue, calm the nervous system, get the blood flowing. That's why and, I think you're right. And African then tissue. actually dealing with the emotional heart as well. So okay. if you're if you're sad hearted, that's probably not going to help. So you can help to lift your emotional heart with hawthorn and rose. <laughs> hawthorn and rose. We talked about that last week in the Thorn Show. Oh, that's mm -hmm. great. And how do they help? Well, how do they, I mean, I'm just going to grab my rose here. The scent, certainly we know the scent has actually scientific things for helping the emotions and yeah. what else? So rose, when you, so rose medicinally as, as a tea or a syrup or whatever, you, whatever you, you're taking it as, it's calming, but it's uplifting. And when you when you take a medicinal preparation of it, you're getting that lovely smell as well. So you're getting you're getting kind of a bit of a double whammy there. But mm -hmm. with the with the hawthorn, um, that's very calming for the emotional heart. So if you're if you're anxious or feeling a bit sad, um, ro well rose and hawthorn, but particularly hawthorn, are very very comforting um, preparations to have, which can help you feel pretty nice when you take them. Oh. So, that's lovely. It's great that you uh, address the emotional heart because a lot of people do get sad around Valentine's Day. Um, mm. I always say I always have Shakespeare, so <laughs> I never feel alone or sad about that. And and I I love this idea of the rose uh, because so it's basically the five senses. You can look at it and see beauty. You can smell it and be uplifted by the beautiful, beautiful scent, and you can take it internally. You can you know, feel it, but also take it internally is what you're t saying to do all kinds of health benefits inside. I mean, I'm, what more could you ask for? <laughs> it, it does more everything. roses. More roses everywhere. Everyone needs yeah. roses. So you, you've covered our physical, our internal, our external, our, our blood, our heart, our skin. I think have we have we covered every oh, so, oh erring goes so erring goes as, as as they used to be called it it's sea holly as it as it's known now yeah, um, yeah. and sea holly absolutely still grows um by the sea um it it grows by the the east coast here where I live um and it's it's one that that we we don't use now really um but i've picked out a little quote from um john gerard who was a 16th century herbalist um and he wrote basically of its benefits to the um to the reproductive organs of uh, of those in elder years um mm -hmm. and he wrote that if condited or preserved with sugar they are exceedingly good to be given to old and aged people that are consumed and withered by age and who want natural moisture okay so this makes perfect sense why falstaff says let it snow air and goes. Let the sky rain potatoes and let it snow air and goes. Because he is of an advanced age and he's trying to woo these supposedly middle aged women. And um although in Shakespeare's day, middle age was a little younger than what we call middle age today. But anyway, so he calls forth these aphrodisiacs 
that are absolutely perfect for the this, this scenario. You know, Shakespeare is really specific. People think, you know, people underestimate it. <laughs> so that's fantastic. And yes. It, it, can we get Candied Aaron Goes anymore, anywhere? I've never I've seen, seen that. I've, I've never seen any anywhere. Um, no, I don't know. I've never seen it for sale. Okay, so when we can finally, when I can finally come over there, Hannah, you and I are going to make, you and me, <laughs> whatever, are going to make um, snow Erringos. We're going to candy some Erringos, folks. Let's Just do it. because I want to see <laughs> what it tastes like and what it looks like and all that. And if it grows near you, we'll forage and then we'll eat it and maybe some lucky person will send them to. I don't know. Can you get food for that? <laughs> I'm not sure. Anyway. It's Valentine's Day, so share the love, spread the love, feel the love, love yourself, and um, love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds. That is your line of the week.